environment or some other way. Their shares will go up and their shares will go down. When we evaluate, instead of looking at trying to price or evaluate, what I mean before we evaluate the externalities, why don't we look at the share prices? Do share prices, are there share price differentials between companies that face problematic or have problematic externalities and companies that don't? Um, if a company decides that uh, we're not going to sell bad hamburgers, we're going to sell good veggie burgers, there's a share price. So I think that one of the things we want to look at is how the market prices externalities in the real time. Look at that differential, predict where the price is going to go, and then investors should ride that way up or down. So I'm, what I'm really asking is, is there any research on what is the market price for externalities here and now? And what is the future expectation of the present value of externalities going to the future. That's anybody there. For everybody. I mean, I, I refer back to the chart I threw up at the start. That is an attempt at, at doing that. And, and it does seem on time, all the time, to, to say that where there are is on balance, around the edge, a little bit more risk from externalities being avoided. It does seem to assist in the portfolio management business. There have been other kinds of studies that have taken on pieces so that, for instance, when you look at emerging economies and their markets and you look at those that some expert has deemed to be uh, more uh, transparent in terms of their uh, reporting that those markets are rewarded in the marketplace for their transparency. So when you take the concept out, there's a little bit there. I would be personally um, reluctant to make too big an argument on that point. Uh, early on, it was brought up, you know, kind of all these standards that might exist out there. I see a big piece of my uh, purpose uh, not as some secret formula for making more money, but as a secret formula for forcing more transparency. So I, 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 I start almost from the other end of, of saying, since I want more transparency, I'm going to get investors who are a pretty powerful force on the planet to demand more transparency. I, um, Looking at things forward is always a challenge. We're always much better looking back because we have better numbers. But um, I guess I, I would also just throw this out, I guess, to the group. Um, there are not a lot of solid policy people associated with investment funds. Um, and I say that because um, I have a little experience with, with two fairly large funds. But think about these two elements. One, conflict minerals. Um, and the other rare earth. So does anybody in the room have any stocks in communication? Maybe? Right. So we have a particular high volatile area with really inhumane right. No, no one would think that what's happening uh, where we're pulling out our, our conflict minerals is appropriate. Um, so, but forget about the humanity, let's think about the risk, right? We have a handful of people that by guns, raping, threatening people are controlling minerals that everybody's using basically for key communication, both domestically but also security-wise. And rare earth, there's what, three major mines? Anybody have any holdings that might have something to do with batteries or solar, right? Rare earth. We're having environmental challenges of pulling rare earth out of the U.S. China's got the other rare earth, and we're not really sure what China's going to be doing with their mine, and I don't know what's happening with Australia. So these are huge holdings across many, many um, industries, and yet does the market reflect that at all? And what should they do? I don't know. I don't know what to do, but I do know there's two things. Everybody knows there's a problem, but we basically are all kind of covering our eyes. I think that's kind of a challenge. If there were more people with funds that were just thinking more globally, I think you would get at human rights, you'd get at environmental damage, but you'd also get at real risk. And that's what I think of those two categories you have. Yeah, one, one of the fascinating things about this risk element is that it is reflected in the companies once the incident occurs. Yeah. 
But that, then, then all of a sudden, now identifying it when the companies are running risks and basically being able to price it in the construction of that before something blows up. That's where the real challenge is, and that is where you're absolutely right, is the transparency element. If you don't have transparency, how can you assess it? We have a question. Just, just, oh, we have another have another question. Hi, Marcello Palazzi, Progress Foundation in the Netherlands. Um, I work a lot with uh, young entrepreneurs, particularly in the clean space and uh, what they call themselves as hot entrepreneurs. And I feel that there is a real uh, distance between the real economy, that is the real economy of the up and coming companies, they feel that this financial system has kind of disregarded them. It's very hard to raise money if you are you know, a 25 year old entrepreneur working in this particular space. Um, and I think this question of how connected the financial system is to the real economy uh, is a really big question. Would someone say something about that? How do we get the financial system back into the real economy rather than you know, the speculation or all these sophisticated products that haven't really helped the transformation we need? I get to talk about time. It was before venture capital, we'll recall, it was you know, nine, eight, nine year holding up until three years ago, and now, now it's an 18 month hold. Yeah. I mean, it's, you don't see the cash coming back in your door in 18 months, you're not there anymore. So a piece of it goes to this ever accelerating short termism that's out there. Uh, and I, I would say that, that the, um, that the a, a piece of the blame could be put on the uh, governance <coughs> side of things. Um, you have uh, always had a general partner in venture capital, but now that that general partner is taking 20% of the ride, that general partner is completely focused on the surety of the 20%. You, you know, that, that, that's going to put them in the mind of an abuser, of somebody who's got, one, they've got a sucker walking in the door that doesn't know what they're sitting on. And unless that's what they're facing, there's another deal they can look at. I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, but... I think the pricing of the partnerships may have something to do with the outcome of the availability of cash. Mm -hmm. No, I would say I think that uh, you know there's a there's a continuum of access to capital, and what we've looked at in California, which is a very large economy, is that it is the going to have to be, not not optimally, but it's going to have to be the role of government and probably nonprofits to come in with both the advocacy around opening up um, different products. Um, we're looking at crowdfunding, which means they have to change regulations, state laws, federal laws um, around regulations, but also produce products that can go into the private sector and create some credit enhancement. Um, traditional banks in the United States have said they're doing no startups. They don't care what type of industry you're with, they're not going to do it. So we've seen you know, a real lack of capital. If you don't have a startup, you're not going to have the company that's going to go public. You're not going to have the gazelle, et cetera. So I think you have to look at money more collectively. I don't think it's necessarily the role of uh, private investors' pension funds to do this, but it doesn't mean you can't advocate for what you need going forward. But right now, there's some real challenges in the space. There's uh, one last question, I think, over there. Did I? No, apparently not. Well then, I have a last question as the time is over. Um, I have a last question to everybody on the panel. Um, which, uh, a bit addition, uh, the year 2030, uh, which percentage of assets under management globally will be managed ESG conform? And I mean that with strong I is the integration criteria and not only exclusion of uh, weapons or something. Um, so. I'm probably going to be the optimist. I would say 30%. 30%. Well, you're um, not I think I would say 40%. Okay. Yeah, 
percent sounds about right because I think that going above that would be would be very very challenging mm -hmm. over the next eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, if by strong we mean a buy-in by the asset manager, yeah. uh, then I'm more of the 15%, but I consider that to be fully adequate to change the way the world is run. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that would be a victory. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that what I call active is right, so people are really committed to do something on that. I would say, unfortunately, we'd probably stay at you know, a lower level of 5%, but I strongly believe that more and more people from mainstream would have control the risk of the opportunity they have, so I would say altogether maybe 25 30 percent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We could discuss much longer, and of course, um, we uh, put some questions and we didn't really respond to every question in depth. This was could be the goal within one hour, but it uh, hopefully gives you some uh, idea of what are the questions to be discussed, to be discussed, and where we have to find a solution. So I thank you very much to you, to the panel, and I thank you uh, for listening and discussing with us. And I wish you a very interesting conference today and tomorrow. Thank you very much.